good evening, everybody. This is the uh, presentation meeting of the Westchester County Rent Guidelines Board, uh, at which the owner members and the tenant members of the board make presentations uh, about their setting forth their respective positions on the guidelines that the board is charged with formulating. Uh, I'll just uh, introduce the board members. To my far left is Eddie Mae Barnes, a public member. Elsa Rubin, public member. Ken Finger, an owner member. Uh, Genevieve Roche, tenant member. Caroline Cope. I remember uh, Emma Jean Lofton Woods, tenant member, and Jane Morgenstern, of course, public member and chair. Uh, April Gray Huertas is our counsel. Chuck Lesnick is the deputy counsel and bureau chief of the division of. Okay, ETPA. That makes my life easier. Um, we have a uh, court reporter with us, Susan Lanzetta. And actually, way back there is Michael Rosenblatt, who just came to take a look and say hello, who looks very happily retired. Uh, before we go to the presentation, I, I'm sorry, I have very, very bad news, sad news. Uh, I, I'm sure you've noticed that Ian Joseph hasn't been with us for the past uh, three public hearings and also the uh, meeting of the board that was before that at the end of May. Uh, it wasn't until last Tuesday that we learned that Ian had died on May 9th. Uh, now Ian was a, a very thoughtful and smart Guy. I think Eddie May was the one who characterized him as an honest or an ideal public member. Uh, you know, he was, he was, uh, his analyses and his insights in his six years on the board were very, very valuable. We, we really uh, appreciated him not only as a colleague but as a friend, and it's just. Uh, he will be really terribly missed by all of us, and I'm sure by all of you. So, that being said, uh, I would, there's one more little piece of business to take care of before the presentations. Uh, I actually misspoke last uh, time at the last public hearing. I said June 23rd we would have rebuttals. We had not made any changes since the prior year. But I did not remember that we did not have rebuttals. So I will ask um, if, I, just to get the, uh, see how the board feels about this, to ask for a motion if you want rebuttals uh, on June 23rd, next Monday, before the vote. Uh, Carol? That's out of order. It was already ruled at one meeting. Now you're trying, now it's trying I'm asking, to what, what I'm asking is if it's the sense of the board that rebuttals are something that we would like to have on June 23rd, 10 minutes each side, prior to the vote and discussion uh, of the actual guidelines, I will entertain a motion if somebody wants to make it uh, for 10 minute each side rebuttals. I move. Okay, moved by uh, Genevieve Roche. Second. Second by Eddie Mae Barnes. No, we were just asking if it was an appropriate motion. I'd say that the board can change its mind, and I don't even know if it was a vote last time. It was it a vote. It, last, last June, in June 2013, a year ago, we, the board elected by majority vote at a meeting not to have rebuttals. I didn't remember that correctly. I, I thought that we did, but when I reviewed the minutes, I saw that we did not. So I'm asking if the board wants to reinstate them. We have a motion and a second to reinstate or to have rebuttals 
10 minutes each side before the vote uh, next Monday evening. Discussion? Discussion, of course. Okay. That's I don't Sorry. know if somebody could clarify this, but is there a difference between debate and discussion? And then I had a second follow-up question. Maybe somebody has a clear view well, of that. I don't, I don't know to whom the question was directed exactly, but we never characterized any of these uh, presentations uh, as debates. And I don't think it's, we're going to start to win that now. All right, I have to ask you then. The presentation tonight. No questions are allowed? Questions from the board are allowed. We've done that in the past and we'll do it again. After the presenters make their presentations, the board will be able to ask questions. The, the uh, guests in the audience uh, will not be uh, asking questions this evening. Okay, and then there's always the question of limiting debate. If we say you can only have 10 minutes, of rebuttal, and I haven't heard the definition of that yet, but if you can only have 10 minutes of rebuttal, that's limiting debate. That certainly should have some kind of a discussion to it when you limit debate. Does anybody have a point? I think there's some confusion here. You can have all the debate you want when you set the guidelines, because that's what you do as a board. But my understanding correct me if I'm wrong since it's the first time I've sat here and watched this happen this way, is the presentations are 20 minutes, it's done by the landlord side, the tenant side. Each gets, each side gets 20 right. minutes. And then at the following meeting, if it's passed by the board, the landlord side, landlord reps and the tenant reps each get 10 minutes to, to rebut what was said by the other party. When you set the guidelines, you obviously discuss everything that's been presented, everything that you've received as material from the guidelines, from the research and analysis, and any research you've done on your own. So there's no limit of debate being... All right, so for clarification, if I may, what uh, Ms. Huertas, what you just said, April, is that there'll be the 20 minutes from the landlord... correct. From who today? Because I thought we were going to flip From it. both sides. Oh, they're, 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 they're both. We did, we did, we did, they did coin flip the, the tenants are going to <coughs> Yeah, so both are tonight. Mm -hmm. And then you mentioned at the following meeting, so my question is, you didn't mention questions by the board of the two presenters. Tonight they can. You can, you can ask any questions you want of their presentation. But your, your direct question had to do with a discussion or a debate, and that happens when you're setting the guidelines. That's not for tonight. Tonight is a presentation, and I assume points of clarification that are necessary that the board has questions to either... That's exactly right. Tonight. Okay, so points of clarification. So no questions. That's a question. Yes, we, can, we will have no questions. No other questions. We always have questions. Perhaps, you know, using the words debate and rebuttal would not be the most well-chosen words but I think it'll go smoothly if we get started. Um, okay. As I said I'll, there. I'll observe. Because nowhere was mentioned the public's point of view, which is kind of I, an oversight. We will have as much discussion by the public members of the board as well as the other members of the board next week before we vote. Somebody will make a motion. Somebody will second it. Mm -hmm. We will have discussion. And likely as not, we'll go back and forth until we arrive at a, uh, a guideline. Now, Thank you. Point of order, please. Yes, sir. Isn't there a motion on the floor? There is a motion on the floor. Don't we need to this, this was, we were vote on that? If somebody would call the question. Okay, I call the question. You may call the okay. question. Yes. Um, well, we, the motion is to have rebuttals as we characterize them uh, next week before we vote and discuss uh, and have discussions. All in favor? Aye. Uh, okay. One, two. It, it, it appears to be uh, unanimous. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes, for 10 minutes per side to be divided as we are tonight. Uh, between the two tenant members as they choose to do and the owner members as they choose to do. So without further ado, 
Um, let me uh, invite the tenant presenters to uh, come up and do the presentation. Mm -hmm. Is this you? Have the hands. Is Joseph Whalen? Joseph Whalen? Yeah. That's my alias. I'm in the witness protection program. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, board members, again. I left my reading time. want to express our deep appreciation and gratitude for the just invaluable contribution that Ian Joseph gave to this board and to all of us. Um, it's not easy up here. It, it, it involves a lot of our giving, a lot of our time away from our loved ones. Um, sometimes it can be very frustrating. And to hear that someone was that was so vital to this board, not to say that the other members, other members are not, nor the, the landlord owners are not. Everyone on this board is vital to the quality of life for the individuals, the tenants in Westchester County, the public, as well as helping these landlords uh, with the increases or no increases maintain their properties. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the thousands of stabilized tenants, I especially thank the public members for the past years of service to us. And that is setting guidelines that we could live with. They are, you're never going to satisfy everyone. There's always a price on everything in our lives. When it comes to our rental apartments, we're not going to get zero every year. I understand that. But I just want to say that being the test that it is to try to reach a balance between the, the owners and the tenants setting a guideline that will help people to stay in their homes is our job. That's what we do here. Last year, on behalf of the tenants, uh, Ms. Genevieve, who was absent, I prepared and presented to the board information that I believe was helpful in determining what the guideline would, was that was set last year. In that presentation was a term, cost burden, and the different degrees of cost burden. HUD.gov, in their June 3rd, 2014 affordable housing article, titled, Who Needs Affordable Housing? And it went on to say that Families who pay more than 30% of their income for housing are considered cost burdened and may have difficulty affording necessities such as food, clothing, transportation, and medical care. An estimated 20 million renters and homeowner households now pay more than 50% of their annual income for housing. A family with one full-time worker earning the minimum wage cannot afford the local fair market rent for a two-bedroom apartment in the United States. Westchester County is in New York, the United States. Something that I have personally had to deal with since last year are people calling me up tenants who are facing and have faced eviction. I'm just going to give you all two examples because it really tore at my heart. 
One was from a Mr. Robert, I won't give his last name. Mr. Robert was dying of uh, bladder cancer. He had to leave his job. He couldn't afford to buy his cancer pain medication as well as pay his rent. Unfortunately, his landlord was not so understanding. He was evicted. He passed away. That particular landlord is still sending letters asking for the back rent. There's another young woman, Miss Jacobs, who works to support her children. She's a single mom. Her hours at her job were cut practically in half, so a paycheck, therefore, was cut. Again, the rent stabilized owner, not having so much compassion, said, so, well, you can't pay the rent, you're evicted. These kinds of evictions is what adds to the ever-increasing number of houseless, homeless people in Westchester County. During a recent interview, Ken Jenkins, one of our county legislators, so stated that homelessness is on the rise in Westchester County. Also, the Center for Housing Policy February 2014 publication stated that the incident of severe housing cost burden has increased in New York State overall. As we hear our presentations tonight, board members, please let's pay close attention to our facts, to the figures, and to all the data that's being presented by my counterpart, Ms. Genevieve Roach. Because it is us, the board, who determine the quality of life for the residents of Westchester County. I thank you for your time. Morgan Stern, members of the board, HCR Council Gray Huertas, Deputy Council Lesnick, and members of the HCR research staff. I'm going to confine my comments to three important factual issues and the overriding policy concern that warrants in this still struggling post-recessionary economic environment for serious consideration. The other issues I usually address in my presentation are more fully handled in a full version of my presentation that um, has been distributed to the board and is being entered into the record. And I ask you to please, uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to read all of the materials. Um, before going through my analysis, I want to comment on the fact that returning this year to serve on the board after having to sit out last year for family medical reasons provided me some welcome perspective on the testimony we heard during the hearings this year, and more important, what we didn't hear. Most of the discussion from owner reps centered on expenses and their objections to the ETPA law. I heard nothing, however, about the correlation between those expenses and their net operating profit, or about the amount of additional revenue being reaped from vacancy allowances, as well as additional revenues from market rents for deregulated apartments. It is important to remember that of the nearly 127,000 rental apartments in Westchester County, only 26,000 of which, about 20% or one in five, are ETPA regulated. The other 80% are not regulated, but they also generate market rate revenues. With respect to the ETPA law and owners' objections to it, that boat has sailed. The legislature renewed the laws in the face of continuing affordable housing emergency 
and it is not within the purview of this board to debate the pros and cons, the law is the law, which this board has a duty to carry out in determining the minimum rent increases necessary to protect affordable housing while allowing owners to reap return in keeping with current economic circumstances. Before walking you through my analysis, um, I'm going to just do a very quick run through through the demographic materials, all of which are contained in the materials with uh, the backup resource sources. Uh, first of all, the gap between wages and rent. The majority of renters in Yonkers, New Rochelle, and Mount Vernon pay more than 30% of their income on rent, many more than 50%. It is estimated in Westchester that a renter would have to work 139 hours a week at minimum wage to afford a fair market rent. Unemployment. <coughs> Unemployment is still higher in these three cities three years after the so-called recovery than pre-recession rates. Poverty. Fifty years after the war on poverty, New York has the fourth largest number of people in poverty. The rate of poverty and the number of people in poverty is significantly higher than a decade ago. The recession continues for many. And in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and um, New Rochelle, poverty is currently at, respectively, 15.9%, 15.5%, and 10.7%. Finally, there has been a significant rise in suburban poverty, and I encourage you to check out the materials from the Brookings Institution and the Confronting Suburban, suburban Poverty .org, um, for discussion, and all of the materials are contained in, in, uh, in the handouts. Finally, stagnant wages and reduced real income. Median household income is 6.1% below its December 2007 level. The average American earns less than he did in 1999, and median income is no higher than it was for the equivalent household in the late 1980s. Okay, the three, the three topics that I want to address are, first of all, rent-stabilized revenue will continue to increase even as the number of units declines. No matter what this board decides, two things are guaranteed. Even when there's no increase in rent guidelines, rent-stabilized income always goes up, primarily due to vacancy allowances and vacancy deregulation. And two, the number of rent-stabilized apartments remaining in the system always declines from year to year. The number of apartments deregulated due to vacancy decontrol in the four years ended June 2013 escalated to a record 5,450 apartments, more than a 10% loss from 2012 to 2013, a 17.3% loss over four years, and a loss of 39.4% since the institution of vacancy decontrol. At the same average rate of loss as over the last four years, it is estimated that an additional 487 apartments will become permanently exempt in 2014. At that rate, in 2014, the number of total units would be reduced to approximately 23,400 units, that from a high of 43,000. And if the 10% one-year rate of decline continues unabated in less than 10 years, well, you can do the math. Yet despite the steady decline in the total number of units, based on the only survey data for the calendar year 2013, the income generated from this steadily decreasing number of units was up 3.6% over the preceding year. Even though, I might add, 2013 was the year for which this board judiciously passed 1.25 and 2.25 increases, which were in effect for the first nine months of 2013. And as rents have climbed and rents on vacancy leases have climbed even more, with average vacancy increases of 16.8% for one-year leases and 18.44% for two-year leases, it is a given that total owner income generated from a dwindling pool of rent-stabilized units will continue to increase year over year. Next point is additional revenue from the vacancies. Um, in ta at tab one of your handout, you will see a spreadsheet that I have prepared that uh, shows that for vacancy increases on the 7.2% of apartments that turned over, owners made additional revenue of $4.8 million, and that just covers the 67% of rent-stabilized units included in the survey. Extrapolating that to 100% would mean increased revenues of over $7 million 
just for vacancy allowances. And that doesn't include additional revenues generated on another 688 apartments that will become permanently exempt in 2013 and 2014, generating market rents. So even in a year that saw a comparatively smaller increase in rent guidelines, one and a quarter and two and a quarter, owner income increased as it always does. Now, something occurred to me when I was doing my analysis this week. And I, I really want to, it's, it's something I hadn't considered before, and I really want to make sure that, that this point comes across. Um, if you look at the, in tab one, the cost to income ratio that the DHCR staff provided for us, I have um, added some additional tabulations on the side of that page. Um, you need to note that as vacancy allowances and vacancy decontrol raise rents on more and more apartments, Correspondingly, smaller rent guidelines for the rest of the apartments are needed each year to, to keep achieve a consistent net operating income for owners. I mean, I think this is really important because if you look at the net operating income percentage in the last few years, particularly 2010 and 2012, when we passed reasonable increases, you will, you will see that you can pass smaller increases as time goes on because more and more apartments are uh, having increased rents due to vacancy decontrol and vacancy allowances. Second comment, uh, second subject matter is expenses, and I'm going to be very quick on this because I'm very mindful of the time. Okay. Okay, I'm going to really race through this. Um, expenses. Even with fuel and utilities increasing the most percentage-wise over 2012, um, comprising nearly uh, one-fifth of owner expenses, total expenses, including fuel and utilities, were up only 2% over the prior year, and only 2.29% over 2011 levels, while rents and income, income increased 7.2% in the same period. Since other than fuel, the increases for expenses were not statistically significant in terms of percentage of overall expenses, um, and since real estate taxes comprising the second largest piece of expenses only increased 1.5%, I'm going to confine my comments to discussion of the uh, increase in fuel costs. And the point to make here is that the board has already, has already passed increases in 2008 for prices that exceed the prices from this past year. And those increases are already embedded in the rent base. So unless prices uh, exceed the 2008 level, there is no need for additional increases because that's already been given. Secondly, um, the um, prices are projected to decline further in 2014 and 15, and all the material is in the binder to support that. Okay, so here's the biggie. Net operating income. I want to focus the remainder of my presentation on the material of the spreadsheet at tab one of the materials. If you look at nothing else in the materials, the spreadsheet and the explanatory footnotes contain all the information you need to come to a conclusion on any necessary rent increases before even considering the equally compelling policy and equitable arguments. Okay, turning your attention to the spreadsheet, you will note that in addition to income increasing from 2011 to 13 at an amount and at a rate greater than expenses, in absolute dollars, owner cash flow before depreciation in 2013 was a whopping 26.6% higher than in 2011, with cost to income ratios in 2011 and 2013 a healthy 33.6% and 34.7%. Moreover, results in those years in which the rent guideline increases, excuse me, moreover, these results were in years in which the rent guideline increases in effect were 0, 0, and 1 and a quarter, and 2 and a quarter. Uh, I'm going to skip. I have other comments. They're contained in my full presentation talking about 11, 12, and 13. I'm going to jump to the projected, in, uh, projected numbers for 2014. The crux of the, this is, and this is really the crux of the argument. Um, I prepared the projection. You'll see it on, the, on that spreadsheet. For, uh, and the conclusion you can reach based on that projection is that no, 
or very, very low increases are warranted. And I'm going to walk you through the calculation very quickly. If you have any questions, please, please feel free in the next week to contact me. So number one, conservatively projecting income at the same level as 2013, 274, 292. And we all know that it will go up. But even keeping it at the same level, then adding to it additional income of $4.83 million that will be generated, assuming vacancy allowances occur conservatively at the same number and rate as in 2013. And without even factoring in the additional revenue to be generated by the 3 and 4% increases passed last year that will be realized in the first nine months of 2014, and allowing for an additional generous 4.42 increase in expenses in 2014 over 2013, which will be more than double the 2.2 increase from 2012 to 2013. Factoring all of this in to the equation, the owners would still realize another year of 33% net operating profit in 2014, even without including the additional windfall revenues from, from those apartments that were deregulated. Okay? So if you have any questions about this analysis, please, please, please feel free to contact me. Um, the next point is the impact of rent guideline increases on both owners and tenants. While it was courageous in 2010 to freeze rents for the first time in over 25 years, it now behooves the board to consider doing it periodically. Just as rent increases are routinely passed, when the economics and the demographics make it the reasonable thing to do. This is particularly the case because rent, regular uninterrupted rent increases, which are never rebated and are permanently embedded in an ever-increasing base rent, can only be adjusted by periodic rent freezes. While the rent goes up, it never gets rebated. So periodic freezes, when appropriate, can at least mitigate the effect of multiple increases that turn out in hindsight to be higher than necessary. And please, um, I beg you to look at my analysis in the prior years of where some of these increases were higher than necessary. Doing so, fulfills the board's mandate to protect tenants and help preserve affordable housing without sacrificing a reasonable rate of return for owners. Last year, unfortunately, the board passed increases that were considerably higher than necessary. Indeed, my analysis shows that a rent freeze last year would have been justified. Now we're being asked to compound those excessive 3 and 4 percent increases with new 4 and 6 percent increases and 40 and 60 dollar minimums. Increases that are well beyond any numbers tied to the survey data, CPI, projections, you name it. There is a spreadsheet in tab 1 that calculates that if those increases that the owners have asked for of 4 and 6 percent are passed, it would garner the owners between 16 and 31 million extra dollars. Every fraction of a percentage increase more than the minimum necessary contributes to the result of pushing more and more apartments out of ETPA We as a board can't control the laws in vacancy decontrol, vacancy allowances, MCIs, and the like, all of which are leading inexorably to the dismantling of a system put in place along the final paragraph. Thank you. Uh, put in place to preserve affordable housing. We can't control the economic conditions of persistent joblessness, stagnant wages, and governmental cost cutting that are squeezing low and middle income families even as food, gas, medical, and other expenses continue to rise. But this board can control rent guidelines that would push more apartments at the upper rent levels into vacancy decontrol and further reduce the pool of affordable housing. And we can refuse to exact a poor tax on the 34% of apartments 
with rents below $1,000 a month. A tax that would either force long-term tenants out of their homes or require them to spend that extra money to keep a roof over their head at the expense of food, medical, and other necessities. It is not appropriate to ask those tenants to use their staff's dollars to put more millions into the pockets of owners who are already reaping a reasonable and consistent net, uh, net operating income. So, in conclusion, as the numbers show, we can enact rates at zero or very, very close to that, which protect tenants and still allow owners to reap net operating profits consistent with those achieved in recent years. Thank you very much. Just a statistical one. Uh, I think you said before, and I know you know what the facts are, but uh, something about the board setting minimum rents, and we just set maximum rents. You said no, the, it's, a, it's a question of semantics, Joe. Yeah. What I'm saying is the mandate is the law. The mandate is to preserve the small number of affordable housing, which is only one in five of the apartments that are available. And so while we need to ensure that owners reap a reasonable return on their investments, all the analysis shows that we can do that. And in order to do that, you only need to uh, in, uh, enact the minimum rate increase that would be necessary for them to still reap this 33%. Yes, yes, okay, yes, is that, did yes, I make it clear? Yes, Thank you. Yes. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending, taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. We really appreciate it. Over the past three meetings, we've heard from tenants and landlords alike regarding their perspective of how what we do up here affects them. We know from the heart rending stories we've heard, which I'm positive are factual, that there's a lot to be doing this for me. However, the one thing that I have to bring to your attention is that we're, our hands are tied in a lot of ways. What we're ordered to do or charged to do are specifically delineated within New York State law. When this was set up, this whole rent guidelines operation, back after World War II to accommodate and also protect tenants and help landlords. It was done so that there would not be any gouging. I'm not saying all landlords did that, but I'm sure we always hear about the worst case scenarios. The same with what goes on with our tenants. We hear about the worst case scenarios. We don't hear people get up here and praise their landlord. We hear about the landlords that really should be, um, I hate to say this, but taken outside and uh, whipped and done a few things too. However, and I know I'm on record. However, there are a lot of good landlords too. And I was sorry to see a couple of them go this past year, go because they had housing within their family for decades that had been passed on to them. And it would that their hearts to have to sell and get out of the business because they couldn't do it the way they wanted to, which was help their tenants out, work with them, provide what was necessary to the tenants, and still maintain their buildings. Because again, people fail to realize that every landlord is in business. And the one thing that our, our forefathers did give us in this country was not only freedom of religion and other aspects and freedom of voice, but also the ability to be an entrepreneur, a person who could start a business and, and make a fair profit out of it. There's no such thing as gouging or, or greed, because greed just destroys everything. But in the long run, we can work together. And that's why I first said when I spoke at this meeting a couple of years ago that this is not an adversarial position that we have. We're here to make this work. I'm sorry to say I, my hands are tied. I can't do some of the things I'd like to do. And I'm sure it's the same for everybody sitting up here. But there has to be more done on both sides. And I think that if we sit and we analyze and we look at everything, as I said, it can, both can be a winning side. I really believe that. 
But the landlords are in business, so that means they can make a fair profit. They don't have to go into their pockets to supply paint, hot water, water, electricity, garbage, re uh, removal. All these things should be coming out of the rents. And if there's something left over, good for them. They have something that they can profit from. I'm sorry to say that I don't need to turn around and read the statistics that came from the, our Department of Housing. But I pulled some articles, and they're in the packets that are handed out, or the paper um, archives. They're all talking about what's gone on this year. I could go back to 2000, and they were going on then, too, in different degrees. But because we had a bad winter, because we had such a bad economy, because we have such poor unemployment, very bad unemployment, what we have is the uh, perfect storm. And it's affecting everybody. Not only affects the tenants, it affects everyone. The oil companies want to be paid, so they raise their rates. What's going on in the Far East affects every single one of us. There are things going around the world that affect everybody here. We just always stay, we're always one step ahead in America. And now it's catching up with us also. But you cannot blame somebody who has a building, who started a business and wants to earn certain money to be able to support his family. The right to raise rents because he's paying more money out than he's ever had to pay. They've done some cut, cut costs. And if you talk about some of the insurance costs that are out there that have gone up tremendously, what our landlords have done is they've taken on more responsibility. They've raised their deductibility to lower their insurance costs. That's why if you notice on your uh, statistics, it shows that insurance hasn't gone up that much. It hasn't gone up that much because the landlords are taking a step that they think can cut a cost. And what they do is they raise it up and they gamble. And they say, well, if I get hit with a suit or I get hit with a real problem, I'm going to have to deal with it. And then they have to go into their pocket. But other things they can't walk away from. The man that delivers the oil wants to be paid. Tell them Con Edison to wait for their money. They'll cut off your electric and gas. The water department. We have a water war going on in Westchester County right now. And the articles that are out there, water can go up higher than anything else we've seen. It's unprecedented what they're going to charge. Matter of fact, if you have septic, if you happen to live someplace where you're allowed to have septic and you don't have public uh, sewer, they're talking about raising taxes for that purpose, that the people that own homes that are have, that have, a, um, have septic instead of sewer, that they're going to get charged. People that have water wells are going to get charged for the water they're using. Why? Because the aquifers run under the land. All those aquifers feed into our reservoirs that feed into the system. So we're getting away with something for the people that have septic systems. And I'm talking about Northern Westchester, areas that really aren't affected by the housing situation right here because there's no big, tall, uh, multiple uh, dwellings. There are more or less private homes. But everybody is getting hit wherever anybody can by the government in raising money. So what happens to the people that have buildings like we have down in New Rochelle, Yonkers, Mount Vernon, White Plains? Those people are getting hit with increases in water that are cost prohibitive. And of course, they can't go back to the tenants with this. So what do they do? They have to raise rents to be able to make these bills payable. They shouldn't have to go into their pockets. And I'm sure many of them are doing that right now. That's why we have two people that we both respect, that we respect and looked forward to hearing from at these meetings because they loved what they did. They loved their tenants. Some even live with their tenants. But they had to sell their buildings. My heart goes out to them. My family's been in this country since the 1800s. My people were never involved in ownership. Not that way. Not landlords. But if they had to go through what some of these people are going through, I think it's disgusting. I think it's disgusting what the tenants go through. But I can't just base this on what we hear here. The law stipulates that we are to take into consideration to come up with finding the prevailing real estate taxes and sewer and water rates, gross operating expenses, costs, including increases, insurance rates, governmental fees, cost of fuel and labor costs, we're supposed to take into consideration course of availability of financing, including effective rates of interest. Yeah, interest rates have come down. The government ordered that. So that, they're not getting hit with the landlords. But you've got to look at it the other way. If they have to go out and get a loan, 
some of them are going in to very high interest rates. Why? Because they have to get people to co-sign with them because their buildings are maxed out. There's a lot involved in this that we can take, think about and take into consideration. The supply and the demand of housing. Yes, we have a tremendous gripe in this county, but so does the rest of the state. There's not enough affordable housing anywhere. The country is having a problem with this also. And the sad part is people don't want to get involved. And that's probably the biggest problem we have, is trying to get people to stand up and start doing things that will help one another out. Reach across the, the aisle, reach across the, the street. You have that now where they had Sandy, where they had I mean, all the different situations that have happened, natural disasters, have also brought us closer together. But it doesn't stop the problem that exists. The landlords that own buildings have to repair them. We won't know the actual reaction to what's happened with this bad winter until next year. You won't know it until you have a bad hurricane and those flat roofs start to leak. That's what's on these buildings in many cases. Many of these buildings are 80 to 100 years old and older. And they're trying to hold them together with gum and glue. They can't afford to do what's necessary to keep these buildings in shape, but they're trying. And I'm not, ple I'm not up here pleading, I'm just telling you facts. Facts that are out there. And going back again to the facts, we do have substantial data that is not from us. Forget the survey supplied by our people to our housing association the state of New York. Forget that. I don't even count it, to be honest with you. Take what's going on in the newspaper. There are people that are in the middle of the road, and they're reporting what's going on. I found out I'm cost burden. I'm paying 50% of my income out on rent. That's not the oil I keep arguing with my husband because he wants to leave the state, like a lot of other people are doing. I don't want to leave the state of New York. My family grew up here. His family grew up here. I have grandchildren here. I don't want to go. Yes, there's places I can go. And we're losing a lot of our young people to out in neighboring states and Florida and Arizona. And I feel bad for them. But that's where they have to go to be able to look forward to live. So why don't we try to keep everybody here that wants to stay here? There's got to be a middle-of-the-world compromise. Zero-zero is totally uncalled for. Just by taking these statistics, looking in the newspaper, hearing the news reports, you're not deaf, dumb, or blind. It's there. A rate increase is necessary. Anybody that says anything else, I'm sorry, I think you have a problem. We need increases. But on the other hand, the landlords also should be working with us to keep the people in the apartments. And I think that's, I've seen and I know people that have done that. We have to work together to appease each other and make this work and show the rest of the world that we can do it. And I think I'm talking too much, but I really believe that we can all come up with a fair decision. The zero, zero, they're talking about adjusting. You never adjust. You never adjust. The government can't adjust. They keep printing more money. Uh, we have to do the right thing for everybody concerned. And these landlords don't have to sell their buildings because I don't want to see us lose any more apartments. Thank you. Questions. Yes, Carol, now if you want. Anyone has any questions? Well, let's, let's do it all at once. Yes, thank you. April is handing out the uh, information. I just want to uh, add our condolences to Ian's family. Uh, as was said, Ian was a valuable member of this board and one who I enjoyed working with and uh, enabled us to reach a reasonable resolution the last couple of years. Um, uh, members of the uh, board, Madam Chairwoman, uh, members of the public, obviously, uh, I, I would like to just go over some statistical information, which is taken 100% from the surveys and the other information we received from the, uh, uh, from the uh, those, uh, rent guidelines, uh, people, Mr. Huey, uh, Sal, and the other people. Uh, in looking at the particular uh, survey charts, the increase in income from 2011 to 2012 was $9 million, or 
2012 to 2013, the increase in income was almost identical, actually 9.5 million, or 3.6 percent. On the other hand, the increase in expenses uh, went up 1 million, or half a percent in 2011-2012, but the increase in expenses this year went up 4.7 million. That's actually a net difference of well over three million dollars and actually a net loss in increased income. Now, one of the issues, and I'll get to it a little later, has to do with vacancies. Uh, there were, uh, the, the reason why the income went up last year was the fact that there were less vacancies. And if you look down when we get later on, vacancies went down 21.5% from last year, 15.7% from the year before, a cumulative decrease of over 37% in two years. Less vacancies means more income for the landlords, obviously. Thus, where there were 1,500 apartments vacated prior to 2012, that number is only down to 1,000 per year, of which about 5% were actually co op High rent vacancies are down to only 134 this year, from 235 last year, an average of 500 for the prior years. These are real numbers. These are real decreases in areas where we've heard the tenants constantly point to more income for the landlords. It's actually not growing and in fact is decreasing. Looking at the vacancy chart, the increases for the uh, vacancy rents are really not substantial. When you look at the 1000 to 1199 area, almost 50% of these, 116, are within the same range, and 90 within the next range, 12 to 1300. As the 800 to 999 uh, dollar rental area, 68 are in the same range, and 88 in the next range. For one year, leases after a vacancy, almost 10% of these new leases after vacancies resulted in decreased rent. 20% were under 5%. Almost 75% of the increases were under 20%. This is not how the landlords can maintain their buildings and make money. For two-year leases after a vacancy, 10% resulted in decreased rent. Almost 20% were under 5%, and 50% were under 20%. So the, this whole uh, bugaboo about vacancies is nothing but a fanciful wish list on behalf of the tenants trying to show that money is coming to the landlords in ways that it actually isn't happening and in fact is actually decreasing. When you look at the expenses, as I said, the increase in expenses last year, 4.7 million or a 2.2 percent increase, and if you look at the reasons in ETPA for the rationale for this uh, a rent guideline increase, it looks to the increase in expenses. Fuel went up 15.8 percent in this uh, in this year and over 150 percent since the year 2000. Over 150 percent increase in fuel. Utilities went up 6 percent this year. Real estate taxes 1.5 percent. But when you look in the cities where 84 percent of the ETPA units are located, the percentage increase in taxes was over 3%. Water, Yonkers was up 85%. Insurance, over 6%. The cost to income ratio, including interest and depreciation, went up 1.6% this year, while it had decreased in uh, prior years. This means that there was less available money for capital repairs, regular repairs, and other expenses. And you heard from many of the tenants here complaining that their buildings were not properly repaired. Well, if you look back to 2010 and 11, when we had the zero in the following year, we had one and a half and two and a half, those are the increases that, or lack of increase, that was kicking in between 2012, 2013, and this year. This year. So there will be actually less money for the landlords to spend now, because it works on a two-year delay because of the uh, fact that the guidelines don't go into effect until this October, through the next September. So whatever we do now will take effect in 2015 to 2016 to 2017. And that's why the landlords are getting hurt this year by the lack of an increase 
three years ago and a very minimal increase the year after that. Uh, if you look at the projection of the commensurate rent adjustment, and that's one thing that we looked at last year, if I remember correctly, it's one of the things that uh, Ian was involved in. I have extrapolated and taken the New York City numbers from the PIOC, the Price Index of Operating Cost, and compared them with what the uh, DHCR has set for for our guidelines. If you look at net revenue without vacancy, which is probably the reasonable way to look at things, uh, you're looking at 3.5% uh, in Westchester, 4 and 3 quarters percent in New York, 8.5% for two years in New York, and 6 and a quarter in Westchester. If you're going to adjust the CPI, which is only fair because you have uh, real dollars that you should be considering, uh, even with vacancy is 3 and 3 quarters percent, and 6 and 3 quarters percent without it for New York City, and 1 and 3 and a half percent up here. If you look at it uh, without the vacancy, which I would submit, again, is the proper way to do it because of the deteriorating and minimal effect <coughs> of vacancy on our income, you're looking in Westchester at 4 percent to 7 percent. Uh, in terms of the low rent guideline, the average rent uh, cost of operating an apartment is $1,024. As Jean have said, 34% of the apartments are under $999. Therefore, the average landlord or other tenants subsidize 34% of the apartments. This isn't fair, and this requires a low rent adjustment. So for the reasons that have been set forth economically, in the survey and the uh, computations that have been given to this board, not speculation, the real numbers from the survey, the landlord should get at least a 4 and 6 percent increase and a $40 and $60 low rent adjustment. Thank you. Anybody have any questions?